Well, I wanted to start off with something that I heard you once say. You said the Pattison's group history is to take something that doesn't work well and over time to fix it. I wanted to ask you how that applied to Gold Seal. You know, what made you think that would make a good investment back in 1984 when you bought it? Well, I was actually uh, in my office at Expo 86 and uh, I heard that there was going to be an auction to sell the Canadian Fishing Company in Seattle at this auction. And uh, so I went down and uh, was the highest bidder and I had never been in the building. I had never met the management and I hadn't done any due diligence. And uh, because, I, because the fishing business, of course, has been a very important part of this part of the world for years and years. And, and of course, the Canadian Fishing Company uh, was a well-known company. I, I hadn't been involved at all in the fishing business, and, but I used to sell the family cars when I was selling cars uh, for a General Motors dealer. So I was familiar with the family uh, and people that had been in the fishing business. So anyway, that's how we wound up in the business and we're very happy with the company and we've expanded it today. And so that turned out fine. Were you able to expand its market share quite a bit over those years? What did you go in to do to change it? Well, no, we got involved to uh, expanding it. We bought some competitors out. And then of course we took the company to Alaska where it is a significant part of the company's business today. So uh, in the three decades since, the environmental outlook has changed considerably around the world in terms of activism. Um, what risks does a canned seafood company face at a time where there's growing concerns about the overfishing of our oceans? Well, I think everybody is concerned about that. And uh, the climate has effect too on the fish because it's as the, as the ocean gets warmer, then of course it affects the, the, what the fish do. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we have been concentrating in Alaska uh, where more and more of our business has, has uh, been uh, more predictable, let's say. I wanted to talk, continue with that theme on climate change and sustainability issues a little bit more um, because you know those that kind of activism could pose a risk to one of your other businesses, West Shore Terminals. Um, it's the biggest coal exporting facility on the west coast of the Americas, I believe. But one of its top customers went bankrupt earlier this year. What's your outlook on that business? Can it survive in a time when there are voices increasingly calling for divestment of coal or to phase out coal? Well, uh, we're in the service business <clears throat> and we're not in the mining business. And so if, there, if uh, we have the opportunity to ship coal, we ship uh, coal that our, our customers want us to ship. So we have nothing to do with the actual mining of the coal. You can see plenty of demand still for sh for people needing to ship that coal out to other markets. Well, the customers decide what they want, and then a qu the question is, we're here to service them. If they if they are using uh, th thermal coal, we will ship it to them, and uh, and of course we do metallurgical coal too, which is a very significant part of the business. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit more about one of your other public companies in your portfolio. Uh, you made a bid to take CAM for private last month. Lumber prices are low. There's the uh, softwood lumber duties in the U.S., which affects the biggest market for B.C. lumber. Supplies have been hit by the beetle infestation. What made you want to double down in the company? Well, you take risks, and uh, <clears throat> certainly uh, the market in BC is not good from a point of view of, of the supply side. <clears throat> and, uh, and so, uh, and the prices have fallen in the States and uh, we're a private company and uh, we've been involved in CAN4 for 10 years 
And uh, so the, when the market fell and the stock was down, we decided that uh, we would uh, make an offer and if people want to take it, uh, fine. And if they don't, well, that's fine too. So you saw it as a buying opportunity. Are you confident the deal will go through? No, I, 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 don't, I can't answer the question. Uh, the board has to uh, get a evaluation of what they would consider to be a fair price. Uh, and uh, so that's under, undergoing uh, right now, the getting uh, values. Mm -hmm. But we have nothing to do with that. Do you have any sense of a timeline on when you might? Well, that I understand that they should have something within the next month or six weeks. So China is Camfor's second biggest market, I believe. Um, relations between Canada and China are not at their best, <laughs> the worst in 50 years, I think, actually, since diplomatic relations were established. Um, we've seen canola and meat exports already impacted by that dispute. What's your outlook on that relationship, and how do you manage political risk as a business? <coughs> well, certainly, I have no influence in any way and have no idea, uh, but <coughs> uh, we're concentrating the company right now into the U.S. and other places. Uh, we, <coughs> we just made a major investment in Sweden with Canfor, and so uh, we're concentrating on uh, a different diversification of the business. Trump has advocated a decoupling of, of China and U.S. economies. Um, he's shown a readiness to escalate a trade war that's having global reverberations. Um, what kind of an impact will this have on the global economy and how are you preparing all of your businesses to deal with that? Well, the answer, first part of it is very significant. Uh, we'll just we just have to adjust to whatever happens, happens. You know, Canada and the United States have had such a close relationship for so many years uh, that anything that happens in the States is, has definitely a significant impact in Canada. And uh, so we just uh, are concentrating on where we think the stability of what we have can continue and adjust. Uh, in our case, we're interested in investing more in the U.S. How concerned are you about this? Over your many decades of doing business, how serious would you characterize the current tensions between the U.S. and China? Between the U.S. and China? I wouldn't even begin to answer that question. It's far more complicated than I understand it. But you are, you are very concerned. Well, we are concerned because we have significant, uh, we do a significant business in, in China, and uh, we, uh, we're very concerned about Canada's relationship with China, and uh, so we just have to work through it. As, as, a, as a business, do you think you're, we're approaching an era where businesses will have to essentially take sides, decide whether they're going to do business in U.S. versus China? I don't know. I hope not. We, uh, we do a lot of business in the United States, and we've been doing more and more business in China. Uh, I, I, I'm talking about our company. And uh, so uh, what happens politically has a dramatic effect with us. But we're diversified, and, uh, and that's good. Um, are your businesses building cash in preparation for a downturn? Yes. In significant amounts? Well, we want to continue to grow the business, but we are certainly watching our dollars um, maybe a little bit tighter than we were before. And when did that start? Oh, uh, I'd say started with us here about six months ago. I wanted to turn a little bit back to the domestic scene here in Canada and the federal election that's coming up. What does the next government need to do to inspire more private investment in Canada? Well, they have to start by being business friendly and whatever that, all the things that means. 
And uh, uh, I think that uh, business is what creates the jobs. And uh, we need to be friends with as many uh, foreign countries that, as we can because we're, we export so many things to, in this country. And so it's from a political point of view and a business point of view, uh, the more friends we have, the better it is for business. What about on the tax side? Are there, you know, the tax competitiveness of Canada? No, for we're, Canada is not tax competitive with the Americans. Is that something you would like to see a new government? Well, for I think it needs to be looked at uh, because at some point, money is, you know, a, a coward. It goes where it, it's safest, and uh, and also uh, that the taxes are less, and uh, if significantly less in some cases, and then you got the political risk. But money goes where it thinks it will get the best return, and and then. Is it safe or is it high risk or all of those things? So you decide how much risk you're going to take and where. But right now, certainly, uh, the U.S. is an attractive place for investment uh, today. So which of your businesses have been focusing more on the U.S. market because the of that? The forest products, lumber. We're, con we're continuing to invest in the United States as well as overseas in lumber. What about you? How do you allocate your personal fortune? Well, mostly it's how much I can borrow from the banks. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, we continue to, we're a private company, and uh, we don't have really any significant public stocks. Uh, we had uh, some stock in Canned for, uh, and so we wanted to, to uh, make an opportunity to take it private. Uh, so we have a, a number of stocks, but nothing significant. Most of our, any money we have, it goes back into the company to grow. Uh, we're a private company and we're concentrating on the growth of that. But your personal family assets, is that all rolled into the company as well? well or do you have a separate portfolio for that? Well, I do, but it's not material. I, I remember you told me once that one of your neighbors in West Vancouver had come to you for advice asking if she should sell her house. This was, I believe, at the peak of the market a few years ago. If she came back to you today and asked you, Jimmy, I've got a million dollars, how should I invest it? What would you tell her to do? What would I tell her to do with a million dollars? I'd ask her her age first. And if she was an older woman, I would say put her in preferred shares in the CNR, Canadian National Railway or the Royal Bank or some very safe place. That's what I'd recommend. And if and, she were 25? And if she's 25 and had some money, well then I think I'd go with some of these high tech risks. One last question, Jimmy, which, uh, you know, I can't end an interview without asking you this. A succession plan. As much as we love seeing you running this big empire of yours, do, is, is there a plan to at some point step down and leave it in somebody else's hands? Well, I have no plans on stepping down as long as the good Lord gives me my health. But if I don't make it home tonight, we have a succession plan set to go for the next 25 years. Have you had that plan for a while now? Uh, we've always had a plan. But we're getting, as I get older, we're, we're moving in with more detail on how, what happens. Like tonight, if something happened to me after this interview, uh, we're all set to go. The company. Nothing has to be done. Nothing has to be sold. And we're in good shape.